This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome to all of you from Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, Ebony Hansen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with our entire show available on our YouTube channel. Today, we look at a three-day summit on initiation practices that's being held in Mtata in the Eastern Cape. Shortly, we'll get an update from the BRICS conference in Kimberley. Another book on the Oscar Pistorius. But this one talks about an accident waiting to happen. What do you think of that? Is that your sentiment as well? We'll close today with some rugby news and then the Joburg Fashion Week with Katrine a little bit later. But first, Katrine Milan gives us a news update. Hello and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Katrine Milan and let's take a look at this morning's top stories. Zambian President Michael Sata has died in London where he had been receiving treatment for an undisclosed illness. Sata died at King Edward VII Hospital in central London last evening when he had been hospitalized since the 19th of October. It is believed that his wife and three sons were at his deathbed. The Deepsville child rapist and killer Kozo Hadebe will be sentenced in the Pretoria High Court today. He has been found guilty on three charges of murder, six of rape and three of kidnapping. In September last year, he murdered Annalisa Mukonto, age five, and a month later murdered Yonelisa Mali, age two, and her cousin Zandile, age three. I will only be happy when he is locked behind bars for the rest of his life. What he did was horrible. A man arrested in connection with the hijacking and murder of Park toddler Tegrin Morris will appear in the Boxburg Magistrates Court today. Gauteng Police announced the arrest of the 32-year-old suspect yesterday. Tegrin died in July after being dragged for a long distance behind a hijacked car. The hijackers had driven off while he was hanging halfway out of the car in his safety belt. 5,000 additional health workers are needed to fight the deadly Ebola outbreak in West Africa. That's the warning from the World Bank President Yim Yong Kim, who was speaking at a press conference yesterday with UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and African Union Chairperson Nukuzuzana Dlamini Zuma. Yong Kim expressed concern over how to find the health workers with the fear factor going out of control in so many places. The death toll from Ebola has since marched a sword to past 4,900. NASA launched an investigation into the cause of an explosion of an unmanned rocket seconds after lift off at the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. The unmanned cargo vessel was bound for the International Space Station. NASA tweeted on its International Space Station feed that there had been an accident six seconds after lift off. Let's just take a look at that launch. And we have lift off of Antares with the three missions that bring Cygnus on its CRS mission to the ISF. Got main engines at 108%. And South African nudists are celebrating this morning after the Hibiscus Coast Municipality in KwaZulu-Natal announced last night that it has approved an application to have the Pinyati Beach near Margate declared nudist-friendly. The application by the KZN Naturist Association to have the beach declared nudist-friendly was strongly opposed by religious and cultural groups. The 500-meter nude beach will be between Trafalgar and Palm Beaches on the south coast. Pinyati is the first official nudist beach in South Africa. All those top stories and more are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Yevon, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Katrina. Now, the 2014 BRICS Trade and Tourism Expo is about to kick off in Kimberley in the Northern Cape. It's hoped the event, which includes an international investment conference, will result in multi-million rand investments and partnership deals, not just for the province, but for the country. One of the sectors expected to draw massive interest from foreign investors is the renewable energy sector. Now, today, a host of South African and international speakers will start the ball rolling in what the province hopes will provide a much-needed economic boost there. 
at the Expo Center. To tell us more is Ulrich Hendricks. A very good morning to you, Ulrich. Very, very massive development in good the morning. Northern Cape. Just set the scene for us, uh, Ulrich. Well, good morning, Eben, and welcome here to uh, the Metasphere Sphere uh, Convention Center here in Kimberley. We're just uh, uh, a few meters away from the big old iconic uh, landmark of the Kimberley area. Today is going to be a scorcher again, 32 degrees, and that is why this area is such a, a, a big draw card for renewable energy, especially uh, solar energy. Um, well, uh, we're standing um, just uh, uh, left from me. There's a host of, of delegates already arriving. Uh, uh, lots of, of, of accents uh, from the BRICS country, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, China, and of course, our very own uh, lots of, of, of accents as well. Uh, uh, quite a number of, of delegates coming, and we, uh, the Northern Cape government, hoping that this will translate uh, into into multi-million rand deals for 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 the province. Uh, well, to talk to us a bit more about this is the Premier of the Northern Cape, Sylvia Lucas. Good morning, Premier. Morning, Ulri. Uh, the BRIC summit. Is, this is really a scoop for for the province, bringing all these people here uh, to talk about investment and tourism opportunities in this area. We've been very serious about making sure that we showcase this province as a preferred destination for investments but also for tourism, especially extreme tourism. But today is about serious business, about trying to make sure that we score deals for our different municipal areas, especially in the areas where they specialize. Like, for instance, if you look at Parais municipality, where Uppington is the hub of the, of the solar energy and the green energy, and that is why we are looking forward to making sure that eventually, after this expo and summit, we will have some investments that we will have to, that we can make sure that the Northern Cape will definitely be on the map. We've got a lot to offer the province. I mean, we've got the SKA, we've got the Salt Telescope, we've got all this renewable energy uh, construction taking place around the uh, around the province. You're probably hoping to to, to to share some some knowledge and to 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 get some deals on that as well. If you have noticed, especially with the coming of of SKA that the Northern Cape is becoming kind of a technology hub in the, in the country, but also in terms of the green energy, especially solar and hydro. We are really num number one in the country, if not in the world, but I don't want to go as far to say that, but we are number one in the country regarding that specific uh, areas. And that is why we are seeing that more and more people are going to come to the Northern Cape, really to share in the knowledge that will come out of the SKA. People will have to come to the source, and the source is in the Northern Cape. It's the same is going for the renewable energy, because they say you follow the sun, not the crowds, and it's ringing true for the Northern Cape, that slogan that we had a few years ago. What message are you, are you taking to, to potential investors? What potential investors can get in the Northern Cape is that we've got ample natural resources. We've got a provincial government that is well structured, structured also municipalities that have got the potential and that are eager to work with, especially foreign direct investors, to make sure that we build the economy and also to make sure that we address the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment and inequality. Because it's important for us as a province that we can make sure that our people will benefit from all the new developments. Because sometimes we are sitting with a big hole and we don't want to go back to that history. But we have said for this new era, nothing about us without us. And that is what we are trying to achieve. We want to show people that we are capable and we've got a great potential. And that is what we hope will transpire from this event that we are hosting here for the, for the following two to three days. A, a, dele a provincial delegation left for China about a month ago. Um, are you specifically targeting the Chinese or are all equal? Just two months before that, we went to Spain. And just uh, uh, last year, we had an agreement with the Armenians and also with the Ukrainians. So it's not necessarily just about China. But what I must say about the Chinese, they are very responsive. And that is something that many of us can learn from them. They are very responsive and they don't wait for opportunities to come to them. Sometimes they are actually the people that are coming with proposals. Like for instance, they came with a big 
development proposal that they want to do in the Decathlon area. We are just, we are not speaking about it as yet, but the fact is it's, it's heartening that people are responding when you are going out there and marketing your province and they are responding. So they are very responsive. But we must also say that uh, there are so many Italians even in the renewable energy sector as well as, 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 as the Spaniards. And very soon there are going to be announcements that are coming from the side of India. So it is, it, is, it is not about the Chinese, it is about the world. And the world is our playground in terms of what we can offer in terms of natural resources. There are, I believe, a quite a number of, of behind-the-scenes the uh, negotiations already uh, on, uh, on the way. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't want to give details, but uh, uh, two years ago, we went to the Hunan province in the Friendly Cities Conference. We attended that. And yesterday we met with people from Chanchi and, and, and Hunan City. That is from the Hunan province. Already people that are coming with proposals that they are going to take to different municipalities. The municipalities that are ready will be able to take up that opportunity. So there, there is definitely, like they say, horse trading <laughs> behind, the, behind the scenes. But there is a, there is a lot of possible uh, investments that can come into the province. Thank you very much. That's the Premier of the Northern Cape, Sylvia Lucas, telling us that we might be uh, looking forward to, to some multi-million rand deals that might be concluded before uh, the conference uh, ends on Friday. I believe that uh, all the delegates here from Brazil, Russia, India and China will not only be here and, 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 and doing business, but they'll also be taken and shown the beauty of, of this province, the Northern Cape. They'll be treated to, to our gourmet dishes, uh, scarf cop, smiley, uh, <laughs> you know, Indian food, uh, 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 Nama food, etc. So they, they, there's more than just uh, nice business deals uh, to look forward to. Yevon? Just uh, quickly, you talk about scarf cop and smiley, a little bit of cultural exchange there, Ulrich. <laughs> how do you think the delegates are going to respond to this, or how have they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, 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 the braver ones might, might just uh, like it, you know. But uh, as for the Nama food, that, that is some, uh, I can tell you from experience, that's very, very lack of food. So, so they'll probably enjoy it a lot. Or if before I let you go, just tell us about, uh, you know, Kimberly putting a, putting a best put, foot forward for all the delegates uh, that, that have come now and, and, and how important this kind of exchange really is for the region. Well, it gives it exposure. There's a, a, a number of journalists uh, here already. I mean, uh, yesterday, just to, to get us accreditation, was uh, an hour or more just in the line. So, so it just shows you the number of journalists coming here, uh, reporting about the event. Also, delegates uh, that are here, that are taking the message where, back to, to where they come from, about this beautiful and uh, historical and iconic place called Kimberley in the Northern Cape. Uh, where, uh, of course, uh, the diamonds uh, were born, but also the Northern Cape, of all its culture, its rich uh, heritage, culture, and, and its people. Ulrich, it's really nice. You always hear a lot about BRICS and about South Africans' involvement, but now you actually can see the BRICS wheels in motion and how it's going to affect our economy. Yes, that, that's it. Um, and like, I, like the Premier also said, there's been a lot of of uh, negotiations behind the scenes. I'm not going to be surprised if there's uh, a number of deals that will be concluded uh, before Friday. Uh, I know as well that there's some international lawyers already on standby uh, here at the, at the expo, ready to, 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 to draw up contracts and to, 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 to basically get those contracts just waiting for signatures. Now, Ulrich, you're also placing the, the Northern Cape and, and the Kimberley region as, as an extreme sport capital in the world. I understand next week you've got a world speed record there at Huxky and Pun happening. That must be one in a whole line of, of, of extreme sports that you guys are, are putting forward. Yeah, listen, I'm going myself to Huxky and Pun and I can't wait because they promised us that they're going to take some of the journalists into the cars and, 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 and speed away with us at, at in, in speeds of excess of, of 400 and 600 uh, kilometers per hour. 
Uh, so I, uh, my male South African male blood is, is, is already anticipating that. But also, you know, river rafting down the Ukhrabis, there, there are a number of, 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 of sporting events that are happening across the year. Axkim uh, the blood round, the world record attempt that start, that, that's going to take place next year. That's, obvious, that, that's one of them. But there's a real uh, host of, 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 of programs that are uh, splashed across the year that, that uh, adrenaline junkies. Uh, can basically look forward to, and the Northern Cape has been doing very well uh, to put uh, the province on the on, on the map in terms of of adrenaline sport. Ulrich, I can't wait to see your adrenaline pumping next week when you're in that fast car. We'll be live there. Of course, uh, Morning Live will also be live there with Ulrich next week. So that should be a bit of fun. It'll be nice to see Ulrich, uh, you know, cringing as he speeds across the Huxky and Pan. It's nice to see bricks, of course making the South African economy tick. We're going east, we're not going west. A multipolar world, that's what we want in the world, not just power centered in one place. But let's uh, take a look at what's on Twitter, what's on our page. Uh, Zwakala, well, we're talking about Senzomi U.S. death, of course. So South African Police Service is questioning two people for Senzomi U.S. death. South African Police Service will be questioning many people. Um, you saw those identified. The RIP captain says, the hiring of private investigators speaks volumes about my friend's murder. May not, may be the family, maybe the family knows more. Rest in peace. Yes, maybe the family does know more. You never know. Regardless what happened, Senzomiya loved and respected both Mandisa and Kelly Kamala. Can we just mourn him and forget the hate? Yes, there's been a lot of hatred uh, targeting, uh, especially Kelly Kamala on social media. There you have the, uh, the, two, the two gentlemen. Please make, they're not gentlemen, these. These are killers. Right. So you want to look at these faces. You want to imprint it in your memory. And you want to phone the police as soon as you see somebody and point out. This is the identicate of Senzo's killers released. Please, we implore you, help the police. If you see these men, make sure that you call the police. They are most probably armed and dangerous. So please, help the police. South Africa, South Africa needs your interaction on that score. Well, let's take a look now at the front pages from around the world. There's a lot else happening in the world. The Times in Europe has a picture of the son of the soldier who was shot dead in Ottawa last week while guarding Canada's National War Memorial attending his father's funeral yesterday there. What a sad story that is. Then, closer to home, yeah, in, on the African continent, in Nigeria, the vanguard is reporting that political parties in that country want their Speaker of the House, Aminu Tambuwal, to resign because he's no longer a member of the ruling party. We thought it was only happening in South Africa. And then in the United States, looking at the Miami Herald, you'll see a nurse there showing the media the protective grab officials believe is necessary to prevent Ebola contamination. Well, we now see the world waking up to the Ebola virus, and it's a good thing. Suddenly, it's on the front pages all around the world. Time for us to take a short break. When we come back, there'll be more on Newsroom. who are participating Dunlop Zone for a power deal. Buy four 15-inch or larger Dunlop or Sumitomo tires and get this free mobile power bank multi-charger. Charge it on the go or on your PC and stay powered up. Come in for a tire deal that will get you amps. Dunlop Zone.
do you think that the media has then fully unpacked of what these strikes could possibly do to the economy if it's going to that extent of a recession? It doesn't mean that when we solve the mining strike that suddenly the GDP is going to go on increase and we're all going to go and have an economic Very boom. True, so yes. we, we've got to go and look at that fact as well. Obviously the media um, you know, can't touch on absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a very complicated situation. Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9 a.m. only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom here on SABC News. Now, Oscar, an accident waiting to happen has been described as the inside story of a teenage daughter's romance that turned into a mother's nightmare. The story that came before the killing that shocked the world looks at the man. Samantha Taylor, state witness and ex-girlfriend Oscar Pistorius, dated for more than two years. Now, to talk a little bit more about the book, we are joined today by the co-author, Melinda Ferguson, for our weekly book slot. Very good morning to you. Thank you for joining Hello, us. Hello, Evan. It's a, a rather different take. Yeah. I suppose it's, it's a lot of this is public opinion. I spoke to some people who share very much a similar uh, opinion as is here. But just tell us the book and, and, and how it's come about. Look, I think the difference be between our book and the others um, is that this is a real inside story. It's a personal story written along with me and uh, Samantha Taylor's mother, Patricia, who found me a year ago and said to me she, needs, she, she, had, she had read one of my first books, Smacked, and decided she needed um, someone like me to write her story. And of course, I was drawn into her story because it gave me insight into Oscar that I thought no one else would actually ever know because he stayed in this family for 18 months. So he really un you know, un un unleashed or unveiled who, he who we think he really was. The true character comes out when mm. you are on that sort of level. So on that sort of note, is there anything in the book that re reveals it? the thing that we haven't heard or seen or seen in the court or, or the press for that you know, matter? I, I think there were things in the court that they touched on his irrational mood changes, his extreme possessiveness. I mean, he would make Samantha Skype in her pajamas when he was overseas because he didn't want her to go out. If, he, if she didn't pick up the, the plate from the table, he would let loose on her. He had guns around all the time. So there was a consistent pattern with him. And then during the Olympics, and I think this is, is a way, in a way the most insightful chapter, he was so broken during the Olympics. He was literally having a nervous breakdown, phoning the tailors 24-7, crying, crying, crying endlessly. And, you know, within about four months, he shot Riva. So this is the background almost to those moments before he went there. Now, recently we've seen the very personal details that came out um, in, in Riva's mother's uh, sort of uh, appeal over the weekend, very personal details about their sex life and so forth. Does this book deal with that kind of thing between Samantha and, and Oscar? It was very awkward for me to ask Samantha's mother in this area. I kind of waited and waited and then I kind of said, when did they start having sex and what was it like? But you know, asking a mother that about her daughter is not easy. But what I gathered was it wasn't a healthy, flourishing relationship on that level. You know, so in South Africa, we're very quick to judge. Uh, and, and, and the Taylor family has been harshly judged in some quarters mm. for, for letting such a young girl sleep over mm. at uh, uh, an older man's mm. house at the age of 15, I think. Seven, uh, uh, it was actually 17. It was 17. Mm. Okay, well. Okay, but no, still, but, at but school st and... Yes. Mm. Um, how does Mrs. Taylor deal with that? Well firstly I want to say I wrote the book with her but I personally probably wouldn't have let my daughter do that so I, I wasn't judging her at all while I was writing the book but I think with her she very close family thought maybe rather bring him into the family than um, have him outside so she's that type of person who would actually embrace and then she could keep an eye on it 
And that's kind of, in, the, in a way, this modern parenting. I think a lot of parents adopt that attitude. Keep him close, otherwise he's going to take. And, you know, um, teenagers are very hormonal at that time. They'll do what they like. So I think for her, although she didn't approve, she landed up allowing him in. So very, very interesting. Why did Sam's mother decide to write the book and, and, and not really Sam? Or, or, or is this a representation of Sam's story, really? Sam completely okayed the book. She didn't want to. She was actually, I think, in such a vulnerable, almost uh, nervous breakdown type of state during this year that we wrote it that she just was unable to actually contribute. The mother, I think Patricia wanted the world to know, in case Oscar was given innocent at the verdict, mm -hmm. that actually this person was an accident waiting to happen. And in the forward, she says, I fear that he might get off. And if he does, I'll never forgive myself for not putting our story out there. Now, an accident waiting to happen is, is an account that we've heard not just from the book, not just from Mrs. Taylor, but also from other people that are surrounded Oscar. What are some of the poignant moments within this context that stands out for you while you put the book together? You know, sometimes I actually cried for Oscar during this book. It wasn't a malicious book. It made me understand him. There were times that I wanted to for believe him, and there were times that I, f I forgave him, and there were times that I hated him. But for me, this little broken boy who came from a motherless type of childhood, who was teased, who went through school, and then who was this fighting spirit. And for me, the most poignant part was him at the Olympics, completely um, unable to meet the expectations, and the people around him who all wanted a piece of him. And us, as a nation, wanting him to be something possibly that he actually wasn't. And that made me feel very sad for him. He sounds like a victim in this whole yeah. picture in, wow. in a way, but mm. is this book painting a picture of a man who killed with intent? I believe he killed with intent. Personally, I believe the book creates the possibility that you can say that he went into that room knowing who was behind the door. What do you then make of the appeal that we've seen this week and, and, and how do you expect this to proceed? I'm so relieved that there's an appeal. I think with a different judge, we're going to get a different uh, verdict and possibly a much more harsh sentencing. And I believe that he needs to actually pay his dues or pay his penalty for the way things really happened. Some of the other people you've spoken to in Oscar's life while putting this book together, what are some of the things that startled you that came out from conversations with them? I never did. I never spoke to, I only spoke to Patricia. I read other people's articles. I spoke to Graham Joffe in detail, the sports journalist. Yeah. He had a lot to say about Oscar. So he was one person I sat with for quite a long time. And he said for years, he'd been telling media, this guy is not who he seems. This guy is not okay. And people would be like, oh, Oscar, Oscar, Oscar. Um, Graham gave me a lot of insight into him on a sports level, how he'd throw his toys, how he'd be like this, get, you know, just behave quite badly, and how the media kept painting this almost victim, yes. this Paralympic who was just so flippin' amazing. The guy who overcame adversity yeah. to become yeah. the greatest, yes. uh, the greatest celebrity, certainly, yes. in South Africa, was a man who fronted the Olympics. I don't think any South African have ever done that, and it might be a long time before that happens again. But thank you for, uh, for coming in today, Melinda, and, and sharing this account with us. Um, it's something that I will definitely look at, because I've had uh, a lot of interviews over the last couple of weeks, and, and, and it's a similar story painted mm. that's picture that's being painted um, around the Oscar story from people that have been in the group or yeah. the wider group yeah. that he's been uh, that he's been uh, uh, hanging out hanging in. out in for lack of a better word but thank you for joining us Melinda funny enough one of those are state witness Mark Batchelor and we interviewed him last week and just to put this into com context he shared these exact same sentiments so before we go to a break, we leave you with a piece of that interview. And that's the thing. That's the scary thing is that this could happen at any time. And I mean, Samantha Taylor was nearly two years with him. It could have happened to her 
you know, his other girlfriend, Melissa Rom, same thing. All the same stories come out, and that's a sad thing. And yeah. that, you know, Riva should have, that should never have happened. And, it's, you know, it's a sad day that she's gone and he gets five years and will do ten months. What, what do you think of the sentence, uh, uh, firstly? And, and secondly, tell us about this journey. You know, you guys have been in similar circles, similar sort of restaurants over the years. Yeah. If not Reva, do you believe that someone else would have taken a bullet at the hands of Oscar Pistorius? I think so. In, in my opinion and in the view of a lot of people, it was just waiting to happen. And I think on that day, they got into their speculation now about that, that iPhone that, that, was, that Carl had had. And, but now the only people that will know on that phone is the three of them, Oscar, Carl and, and Reva. And you know, Reva can't talk. And, um, and that's... In Parliament, Higher Education and Training Minister Bladen Zamande has conceded that the bursary scheme is not enough to meet the growing demand from students. Funding for universities is not enough. We will be open about that. We will continue to ask for more from government as a department. We've always said that the NASFAS budget must be 16 billion rand and that uh, no qualifying student must be prevented from studying just because they cannot afford to do so. There's been concern about citrus exports to Europe and investment contracts. There are more opportunities for us to sell sugar, wine, ethanol, some fruit products than we had before and that uh, that could create jobs. That's business news, weekdays at 6 p.m. on SABC News. ABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. SABC News delivers stories that unify the nation in many ways. Stories that inspire us to see the world differently, appreciate and celebrate our diversity. And mostly, they make this place a better country to live in despite our color, beliefs or culture. I, I, I'm, I am Mahendra Raghunath, Yevanyat, Tabile Wando, Lulu Gabu. Join us every day as we provide updates on local and international news straight into your home. We. We, we are. We are SABC News. SABC News. We've got Africa covered. Hello and welcome back here with Newsroom on SABC News. Let's take a look at the morning's top stories. Zambian President Michael Sata has died in London where he had been receiving treatment for an undisclosed illness. Sata died at King Edward VII Hospital in central London last evening where he had been hospitalized since the 19th of October. It is believed that his wife and three sons were at his bedside. The Dipsler child rapist and killer Nkozo Hadebe will be sentenced in the Pretoria High Court today. He has been found guilty on three charges of murder, six of rape and three of kidnapping. In September last year, he murdered Annalisa Mukonto, age five, and a month later murdered Yonalisa Mali, age two, and her cousin Zandile, age three. 
And a man arrested in connection with the hijacking and murder of Reicher Park toddler Tagrin Morris will appear in the Boxburg Magistrates Court today. Kauten police announced the arrest of the 32-year-old suspect yesterday. Tagrin died in July after being dragged for a long distance behind a hijacked car. The hijackers had driven off while he was hanging halfway out of the car in his safety belt. Remember, all those top stories and more are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Katrin. Now, the successful hosting of the HSBC 7 Series in Nelson Mandela Bay over the last three years has tipped Port Elizabeth as a front-runner to renew its host city's agreement with the South African Rugby Union next year. Our reporter, Janine Lee, is in the Addo area of the region where she spent some time with some of the Blitzbocker ahead of the media briefing a little bit later today. Very good morning to you, Janine. The easy life, eh? <laughs> uh, it's a hard life, Evan, but somebody's got to do it. Um, as you said, I'm here in the Addo area, really beautiful. We spent some time with some of the Blitz Booker yesterday and last night. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But as you said, Nelson Mandela Bay on a great drive to secure the contract for the next four years for the Sevens. Just to give you a little bit of background, in 2012, I think there were something like um, 36,000 people in the stadium. In 2013, that went up by 63% to 58% and a half thousand people. So organizers are hoping this year that there are going to be plenty bumps on seats because I think that is going to swing it in the favor of Nelson Mandela Bay as far as Saru is concerned. I had a chat to some of the Saru reps um, last night, but they were very tight-lipped. I think with the media launch today, I don't think they're going to give away anything about who the contract's going to or if Nelson Mandela Bay does get it. But just to give you something comparatively speaking, Eben, um, just before the, the Blitz book will come to Port Elizabeth in December, December, they will they will do a leg in Dubai and I did some research and I found out that Dubai have already opened their tickets for for their their games and already a hundred thousand seats have been sold so um, just comparatively speaking we are a little bit behind but I, I think organizers are hoping business in PE will pay bonuses early and um, they've dropped the tickets the ticket prices you can now go and watch the Blitz Booker um, for as little as 30 rand so it can be a great family outing um, but we, we need to put bums on seats in order to secure this contract for the Bay for the next four years. Port Elizabeth, though, have done that. They've been really uh, outstanding in supporting even the Kings uh, in, in, in recent times. But, but what is the city then doing to sell this concept to the people there? As you, as you said, Evan, I mean, we just have to look back at the Super 15. We were one of the, the stadiums that had the most people um, that, that came to watch the games. And historically speaking, the Eastern Cape and Port Elizabeth is the home of South African rugby. So organizers are hoping that this is, is going to ring with people and maybe get them to, to get out and go there. And as I said, with the, the drop in ticket prices, that, that will be a big selling point. They'll organize transport from some of the outlying areas to get the masses in to, to come and watch the games. And an important thing to note that um, the sevens for the, the coffers of, of the city, it, it raised something like 200 million and created 700 permanent and temporary jobs. And in, in a city where un unemployment is relatively high, um, that's something that can't be overlooked. And it's going to be one of the issues and one of the points that the organizers are pushing home. They're hoping that the contract will be extended and a bid process won't be opened to allow other cities to perhaps bid to host it. But I, th I think the, um, the Saru guys are going to look what happens in December, how full our stadium is, and then decide to either open the bid process or just say to us here in Nelson Mandela Bay, look, guys, you've got it for another four years. That will be first prize. There is a presser later today, 12 o'clock, but I think Saru is just going to announce the launch of the Sevens here in December and announce some of the people who will be partnering with them. I don't think we're going to get clarity on whether Nelson Mandela Bay has got the contract for the next seven years. Janine, are you in the Addo area with the Blitz Booker? What are they doing there? It's looking at a bit of wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look how nice it is behind me. I'm, I'm here on a farm in the, in the Sunlands Valley. It's, it's called Avoca. The Blitzbocker stayed here last night. Fantastic accommodation. The Sundays River just behind me. Um, you can see all these citrus trees. What better place to be? And they took us out into the Addo Park last night. Um, we had a night game drive. I was sitting next to Frankie Horn. Oh, thank goodness, because this, <laughs> we saw these lions. They were lying on the side of the road, and um, they got up and they looked at us. The spotlight was on them. But I thought, hey, I've got Frankie next to me, 
can't be so bad. Um, and we also had Philip Snayman with us, and we had Branko Dupree. He was also here. They just came and had a look and experienced what is in their backyard. You, you know some of the sevens, Frankie Horn, he's a Port Elizabeth boy. Cecil Africa, he comes from Mich Mission Vale in Nelson Mandela Bay. So it's a province and a city that's, that's close to many of the Blitz Booker's hearts. And um, I'm sure they're hoping as well that, um, that the Bay will get the contract for the next four years. And that's the big thing on everyone's mind, Evan, just for us to get that contract. Now, Janine, you touched on it briefly there, but just recap for us quickly the expectations at the media briefing a little bit uh, later today, and how is it being put together? Well, there's been a long build-up, even a drive to, to promote the city. In fact, um, what, what the organizers want to do to say, listen, you can come to Nelson Mandela Bay, you can watch the Sevens, but there's so much more on offer. They had a sort of a media junket yesterday where they took members of the media, to, they took them to the Penguin Sanctuary in PE, they took them to the 67 Steps on the Donkin, they, took, they brought them out to the Sunlands Valley. I mean, if you just take, for instance, if you leave Port Elizabeth, in 25 minutes you can get in to the bottom gate of, of, of um, sorry, um, Addo, and I mean, you're up in the park, and that's just 20 minutes away. So they're promoting the sevens, and they say, listen, guys, get on board. But if you come and visit, there's plenty that you can do, and it's all within an hour's drive from the city. So they, they're punting it as a destination and also as a sporting destination. Janine, thank you very much. That's Janine Lee sitting watching Lions with Frankie Horn and Branko Dupree. Not a hard life being a journalist here at SABC News. Some of us are grinding out a living year in the studio in Johannesburg. Anyhow, let's take a look at your tweets. What are you talking about? What are you passionate about? Of course, the Zambian president is reported to have passed away. Dorcas Motati says, rest in peace, Michael Chilufia Sata. Lord, as a nation, Zambia, we look to you right now. And so does the rest of South Africa. Southern Africa. Condolences to the people of Zambia. South Africa knows too well the loss of a father. Rest in peace. Michael Sata, hashtag Madiba as well. Thank you. Wisdom Kionga says Zambia's president Michael Sata dies, provoking wishful thinking in Africa. Sata made history when he defeated incumbent Rupia Banda. And desired Desiree Uhuru says our African leaders should learn to build good hospitals on the continent. This will save them from dying abroad. Well, that gives us a little bit different insight. Well, we always go to Switzerland when there's nowhere else to go. Simba says Michael Sata becomes the second Zambian president to die in office after Mwanawasa. Well, those are some of the tweets, of course. We're still waiting for official reports and official word from the Zambian government. You can watch this channel. We'll keep you updated as to how that develops. Also our Facebook page. Let's go there quickly for an update. What's happening on our Facebook page? We'll tell you about that story and all the official scenarios play out today. There you'll see the Dipsler child rapist and killer Ndogozo Khadebe will be sentenced in the Pretoria High Court. He's been found guilty on three charges of murder, six of rape and three of kidnapping. Then also the Department of Education in Limpopo is investigating alleged negligence by school teachers following the death of a great R learner at Maseremulu Park. You also see that the Hibiscus Coast municipality on the KwaZulu Natal South Coast has approved plans for a nudist beach in the area. And that a man arrested in connection with the hijacking and murder of Reicher Park toddler Tegran Morris will appear in the Boxburg Magistrates Court today. All of those and more on our news Facebook page all of the time. You can also visit sabc.co.za forward slash news for all the latest news updates and all the developing stories around. Now, it's exciting times in the world of fashion as the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week Africa opens the runways in Johannesburg tonight. Katrina is going to go there. She didn't get me an invite. That's why she's doing the next interview. Ever next time you know. Well, this year's Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week Africa promises to be a great opportunity for every fashion fanatic to view the top trending fashion designs for 2015. More than 30 of Africa's top designers will present their collections at Melrose Arch in Johannesburg from today up until this Saturday, the 1st of November. Today, I am joined by two Mozambican talents, Taibo Vokar and Belgium-born designer Eliana Rodriguez-Moragi, the creative genius behind Morad. Both will be showcasing 
at Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week this week. Welcome to Newsroom, guys. Hi, nice, it's <laughs> nice to be here. So, Iba, I want to start with you. Your show is tonight. It's How tonight. are the, the feelings and the tense? So what goes through your mind before a show like this? Uh, first, I want to say thank you for inviting us to come and to talk about the Fashion Week. Uh, I'm not nervous this time. Maybe because I did, I made everything I can do and uh, the collection is already done. Now we are just waiting to present and uh, we will see, we will see. But it's a very beautiful collection. That's why maybe I'm happy and I'm very calm because uh, I'm very proud about the work I have been done. Eliana, your show is on Saturday, if yes, I'm not mistaken, and the label is called Murad. Murad. Tell us a bit more about the background of Murad. Uh, so first of all, Murad is the name of my father, so I considered that it was an honor for him to be the name of my brand. And uh, Murad is, there's only three key words that define my brand, which is sophistication, elegance, and simplicity. So this is what I, this is what I aim for. And this year, it's different, the work that I've done before. And I'm very excited for it. <laughs> now, both of you are from Mozambique and yes. Mozambican inspirations. Uh, Taibo, the current situation in Mozambique, how has that influenced your work? Uh, this collection in special talks about this because this collection, the theme is a luta continua, uh, means uh, the struggle goes on. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution, the development of the country from 1975, the year of the independence, until today. So uh, I will, with the collection, I will talk exactly about uh, Mozambique, about uh, step by step of the people uh, in Mozambique. So we're going to talk exactly, exactly about Mozambique and what we are doing for the world. So you know Mozambique now it's in, in a new era and uh, I'm trying to play with this because I'm very, very proud to be Mozambican. Eliana, how has your country inspired you, colors, fabrics wise and all of that? Um, to be honest with you, I, I chose a different color palette this year, but I went very basic in a sense of at home, I always saw spices at home, Indian spices because I'm Indian descendant. So I decided to go for Indian uh, spice palette, color palette. I see the show is called 24 Hours in Mumbai. Yes. How has your travels over the years, have you been to India, inspired this collection that we'll be seeing tonight? It's, yes, but it's not really inspired in Mumbai. It's more of a woman that goes to Mumbai. So we just took the color palette of the Indian spices and incorporated into a Murad style, a Murad lifestyle. So we'll see. Being a fashion designer from Mozambique, how does Mozambique, the fashion in Mozambique, compare to the rest of the world? You know, I think uh, now we, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's gone in special because now uh, the African prints are uh, in fashion. It's uh, the new, it's the new trend, and we have uh, a beautiful African pr African print, mm -hmm. a beautiful African uh, fabric called Capulana, mm -hmm. and uh, I think all the world needs this fabric now. So we are doing a great job, and uh, the, the 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 fashion in Mozambique start to grow. We have Mozambique Fashion Week. All the days we can see more designers, more models, and uh, we start to travel a lot. Uh, we can see Murad and Taibu Bakar, we are always outside and the people start to, to know about fashion, about the things we are doing in our countries. And I think now we don't, we don't need a lot to, to, to depend on, to, to depend on, on uh, other fashion weeks or because I think the fashion is really growing in Mozambique. And every year Mozambique Fashion Week has at least two or three new designers, upcoming designers. And I think it's amazing, honestly, because... And in terms of business, I think yeah. finally we can uh, now say Mozambican people start to buy yeah. the things we, we are making. We're producing Because at home. Uh, I think they start to have uh, new conditions and we start to have a middle class in Mozambique mm -hmm. and start to be a little bit high and we can, we can uh, make the things for our people. So I think it's... Uh, it's a good time. It's, it's a, a good, good time. time now. Yeah. Woman, the urban African cosmopolitan woman. Yeah. We're talking about Africa now. How are women represented in your brand? Uh, in my brand, it's mostly independent women from the age of 30 upwards. 
and it's a very simple woman, but she likes to accessorize a little bit. So, but she's very elegant. You know, it's a, I don't my my clothes are very simple. They're just structured. Mm. That's it. And in your collection, it's um, amazing. Very <laughs> difficult to talk about it because it's it's not spring summer. It's not winter. It's not red to wear. It's not couture. It's a mix of everything. I call it a preta couture because for me it's a, a mix of everything and it's a new era. I try to create a new world for Table Bacar's brand because for the first time I will present uh, um, uh, clothes for, for commercial clothes and mix it with uh, uh, couture with and then we have uh, new lines for shoes and shades and accessories and everything so it's a full collection with everything with African prints with uh, um, it's a new era for it's a new of era for fashion in for fashion too yeah. I think I'm trying to make something special for Africa and to show the world uh, we are really really uh, working hard here in Africa yeah. well guys thank you so much for joining us and the best of luck with this week it's all exciting times ahead uh, your show is tonight if people yes. want to know more we'll be uploading everything to our newsroom Facebook page and you can also get all the Twitter handles and everything on Twitter Yevon is missing out but he's still here Yevon over to you yeah no, I am here did you see some of the pictures I'm amazing outfits I really love the Murad collection thought it was really really pretty and it's African and it's Joburg Fashion Week uh, until the weekend, so if you're around at the City of Gold, it's a good idea to go and have a little look-see. I think it might be a fun night out. Now that's where we wrap it today. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. The show repeats at 2 in the afternoon with a total rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning.